This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hello, hello. Yes, come closer. Please don't be shy. We have got a lot to share with you today, and it starts with this, Mr. B. All right, let's get to it. Coming up, even the smallest contaminant can ruin a batch of cotton. However, we spoke to an expert who shared some tips on how to ensure that your cotton gets to the gin contaminant-free. Also on the show, he has been around dairy his whole life, and that is why this Morgan County producer is on a mission to save an industry that continues to struggle. How he's using 4-H to hopefully reverse that trend. And then later, uh, remember those piggies that went to the markets? Well, they wound up in one of Marsha Crowley's baking dishes. And let me tell you, they were delicious. And so was the sweet potato pie. Recipes for your holiday guests and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. The 2020 cotton season is officially underway here in Georgia, but there are some things producers need to be aware of before harvesting their crop, like contaminants that can be in their fields that can diminish not just the cotton's value and reputation, but everyone else's as well, as John Holcomb explains. If they are already, cotton producers will soon be cranking up their harvesters and entering their cotton fields for this year's harvest. But one thing producers need to be aware of are contaminants, like plastic, which have really become a problem in the last few years. We've always had to battle with contamination, do a good job with contamination, but what has really brought on the emphasis is with the, uh, with the innovation of the round module, the John Deere pickers, with, with the, it's plastic. We've introduced plastic wrapped around these, uh, the modules, which is a very great, good package. It really works well and we all like it and, and it's, uh, it was a great idea and a, and a great innovation, but it has uh, introduced plastic to us and so that's what's really catapulted us into having to, to figure out a way to get this uh, yellow, pink, blue plastic out. The problem with contaminated cotton is that it can ruin an entire section once it gets ginned and woven together if there is plastic or other contaminants in it, something that can be a costly mistake. If it makes it into the uh, woven product and you go to dye it, you can imagine you're dyeing all this cotton and then you have a piece of plastic. So then that whole amount of, 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 yarn, of, of woven product is no good. So it's not just that little piece that's no good. If it gets to the woven product, you may have $100,000 worth of product that is no good now. Not to mention the fact that when cotton is contaminated, it diminishes the value of U.S. cotton as a whole, something that's not a good thing when you're competing globally. We need the cotton coming to the gin to be the cleanest, non-contaminated that it can be so that our cotton doesn't lose any marketability in competition with other world growths. I mean, we're competing with India, Pakistan, China, all these other world growths we're, we're competing with and we want to be the best and the one way to be the best is to be contamination free. However, there is a solution to this issue and that comes in the form of producers doing their part. The first line of defense is, him, is the producer making sure that he and his staff get off of the picker when they see contamination in the field. You know, then the other part is when you're, if you're using a round module, is, is to handle it properly in the field. When you're staging it from where you drop it out of the picker to bring it up to be staged to come to the gin, either by truck or on a flatbed, make sure that you're, if you're using a spear or whatever attachment you're using to do that, that, that your operator understands and doesn't bust that module and doesn't damage that module. Fountain also told me another solution is education, which is something he and the National Cotton Council recommend producers do to really help cotton's reputation globally. We've had a lot of tools and education through this that we've come up with National Cotton Council. And you go to cotton.org and on that website you can go in and there are videos and there's like a 13 chapters, but the, the producer can pick the part, the video that applies to him, the applicable to him in, in harvest and in handling round modules. Reporting in Appling County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, thank you very much. Now, meantime, with a sharp decline in the number of dairy farms around the country, it's more important than ever for dairymen to educate students about their importance to the ag industry. That's exactly what Jay Moon is aiming to do with his work in 4-H and on the farm his family built decades ago. Damon Jones has the story. 
Working in the dairy industry is a 24-7, 365 day a year kind of job. But for Jay Moon, it truly is a labor of love as he was born and raised on this family farm in Morgan County. It's the kind of legacy that has been borne out through decades of hard work. My great grandfather started this farm back in the late 40s with my grandfather. And uh, they started off primarily as a Jersey herd, uh, milking around 40 to 60 cows, and that grew to 120. And through the years, the farm evolved into what it is now, uh, primarily Holstein, uh, milking 120 Holsteins twice a day. So it's safe to say that being a dairyman was in his blood. In fact, his passion for the industry was evident from a very early age. Throughout my youth, uh, I was always active helping on the farm. One of my first jobs was feeding baby bottle calves, and that evolved into my passion for the dairy industry, uh, continuously working on the farm. I'm pretty much able to run the operation uh, alongside my father uh, for any day-to-day -day task. And he's hoping to spread that passion for the dairy industry to the younger generation by working closely with the 4-H program right in his backyard. I work with Morgan County 4-H as an AmeriCorps service member, and one of my main um, jobs is to provide direct service to youth in the form of club meetings, um, activities related to 4-H, uh, district project achievement. This work is important for Jay as the lessons he learned as a student helped set him on his career path. Well, for me, getting involved in 4-H at an early age really made an impact on myself and youth programs and FFA. So when the opportunity arose to, to become a 4-H AmeriCorps service member uh, here in my home county, um, I took that opportunity so I could give back to youth as, uh, so they could experience the same experiences I experienced in 4-H. While low commodity prices have caused a real strain on the dairy industry for the past few years, Moon still remains optimistic about its future, and having his family working right by his side on the farm that bears their name is something he is very proud of. Well, just being out day to day with, with family and working and, and knowing that this is something that my family has worked hard at and we've achieved what we've achieved. We're still here, we're still dairy farming, we're doing what we, we love to do. Uh, it's hard work for sure, uh, but we enjoy it and that's what's important. Um, Agriculture is not easy and working with family and overcoming uh, any obstacle that gets in our way is, is extremely important to us. The future of dairy, there's always going to be dairy. It may look different in the next 10 to 20 years but um, our farm is going to continue on strong. Reporting from Morgan County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, chances are you've already got your Thanksgiving Day meal or meals planned out, but what to cook in the days leading up to Thanksgiving? Now, that's the big question. We've got some suggestions after the break. Yes, we all know that theme music. Time for meals from the field, and it's also time for our dear friend and my good friend, Marsha Crowley. Good to good see to you see again. You, Ray. Um, and one of the reasons uh, why we like getting together, Marsha, is we kind of like uh, it's, it's somewhat of a distraction from the sure daily grind of life. I guess you could say it's a distraction from COVID nineteen, the pandemic. Life goes on, holidays go on. We're looking ahead to Thanksgiving in today's recipe segment, and we've got some good one. We're actually doing pork. We don't do a lot of pork on Meals from the Field, no. but you've got a really good pork recipe. I hope recipe. so, and cooking is in right now. It Everybody's, is. you know, home, working from home, whatever, so sure. they like to cook from home. Very good point. Okay, good point. this pork recipe is so good, I've made it at least five times. It's so good. Easy. Well, can I just say, when I walked into this room, it just Smells smelled good, heavily. All the years we've been doing this, seven, yep. eight years close to oh, it, I yep. believe. I'm like, this smells, this smells the best. Good. It's the best you. it's ever smelled, I got to say. This is uh, two cans of pinto beans drained. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've already got that in there, obviously. 
um, we're going to add to that a can of green chilies. Just kind of sprinkle them around a little bit. And I, I could drink green chilies. Mm -hmm. I love them. They're not spicy. They just seem to bring out the flavor in things. Throw some cornbread on there. Yeah, yeah that'd be good too. <laughs> All right, then you're going to top that with a, um, like a half of a red bell pepper. Just kind of spread it around a bit. And this is sliced. You could use green or yellow or leave it out. I mean, most of these recipes are very flexible. Mm -hmm. Small red onion. And like I said, this all goes in the same um, dish, which makes it easy to clean up. All right, then you're going to top the this mixture. I, that onion's not. The onion doesn't want to leave you, Marcia. It's not cooperating. It likes you. This is four center cut loin pork chops. You okay. just put those right on the top, like that. I have not tried this with chicken, to be honest, but I can't see where you could go wrong if you don't want to do pork and you wanted to do boneless, skinless chicken breast. You could do that. All right, then you're going to sprinkle that with cumin salt and a little bit of cayenne pepper, which you could adjust those spices if you want. Or you're gonna cover these and bake them between 350 and 375 for 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to caution, this oven we have here in the kitchen is the exact same model I have at home. Okay. It took the pork chops twice as long in this oven as it did mine, so it pays to have a meat thermometer. Okay. Every oven is different. And I'm sure y'all knew that, that's just a reminder. Duly noted. Yes, and then when, once these are done, you're gonna um, take the foil off, you cover them with foil, take the foil off and spread it with about, oh, three quarters of a cup of Monterey, not Monterey. Um, Mozzarella? Pepper Jack cheese. Pepper Jack. Yeah, they're okay. going on pepper Jack cheese. And they are so good, I'm telling you. I've made this at least five times. All right, let's house. go ahead and take a look at the finished product there. There's that Monterey Jack. And so you can good. never go wrong with, you can, you can never have too much cheese. No, you can. And like <laughs> I said, if you're going to use chicken and you don't want the that cheese, you can use cheddar. All right. So, what else do we have? All right. This is, I think, a Southern staple. Mm -hmm. When I think of Thanksgiving, my mother used to always make this. So this is an apple pecan salad. From North Georgia? North Georgia apples. Very nice. Of course. They are Georgia apples, very believe nice. it or not. That is two cups of Georgia apples a half a cup each of red onion and celery, three quarters to a cup of Georgia pecans chopped, and about a quarter of a cup of mayonnaise. Now I treated the apples beforehand with lemon juice so that they didn't turn. Okay. So you would squeeze a, like a half of a lemon over the apples before you start. And you're just going to stir this up, if I can find a spot here. And you can make this a little bit ahead. I wouldn't do it, although I have eaten it a day after. But this is really good. And like I said, I think this is a should be a Southern classic if uh -huh. it's not. All right, there's that. Get the idea of that. Everybody knows how to stir, hopefully. If you don't, you don't need to be cooking, right? Now the good stuff. <laughs> This is a sweet potato pie. Yes. And I looked back through our recipe collection. We don't have a sweet potato pie. We do now. We do now. <laughs> All right, I've already mixed together sugar, nutmeg, cinnamon, and a third a cup of butter. I'm going to add to that two eggs beaten. And you can use a mixer for this. It's just easier for TV if you don't crank up a mixer. Sure. Plus, I would get it all over myself. I, and you know me, it would be everywhere. <laughs> this is a teaspoon of vanilla, two thirds cup of evaporated milk, not sweet and condensed. Just want to make sure I say the right thing. Mix that up a little bit. Then you're going to add two cups of cooked mashed sweet potatoes. And, and you I've said that's evaporated milk? Evaporated, evaporated milk. milk. Not okay. sweet and condensed. Okay. Um, because there's already sugar, a little bit of sugar in there. Sure. All right, these are um, Georgia sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. I baked them and mashed them. Okay. I mean, I, you could use canned. It's not going to taste the same. Just, Put some work into it, a little, just a little I mean, it's, it's the holidays. Yes. And you can make these sweet potatoes several days in advance, which is what I did, and put them in the fridge. I'm going to stir that up if I can do that. 
pour it into a prepared pie crust. And you know me, this is not from scratch. <sighs> no, if there is one thing I've learned about Marsha over the years, she's going to go to the store and get that pie crust. That's, I'm just because I'm not good at it. I mean, if you want to make your own, go for it. Teach me how to do it because I am not real good at it. You're going to pour this in the pie crust. I'll probably mix that up a little better, but I didn't. And you're going to top that, if you'd like, with three quarters of a cup of Georgia pecans. You're going to bake this at 375 for 30, 35 minutes. And it is really good. And I'm not a sweet potato pie fan, but this is very good, very Southern. The, there you the, have it. the pecans make it too. I almost said the pecan. Pecans, yeah. I, I almost said pecan, but. And you could leave those off, but they just make it to me. I guess it depends on what part of your Georgia you're from. Some people say pecan, some say pecan. I've always said pecan. Pecan. So. Bottom line, as long as you're using them, that's all we care that's about. That's all we but care. Marcia, that is some absolutely uh, delicious looking stuff. And as always, folks, you can make these recipes yourself. That's why we do this. Just log on to farm-monitor.com. You can find everything you need right there in the recipe section. Um, I have lost count. I went back through that recipe. I was looking for a certain recipe a for, for a personal standpoint this past mm -hmm. weekend. Um, and it, th there's just massive amounts of recipes And when in doubt, there. you call me. You I just call Marsha. <laughs> so, Marsha, as always, good to see you. Uh, happy early holidays. Happy early. Um, I'll wish you a happy early Thank Thanksgiving you. right now. You guys have a happy early Thanksgiving, and we will see you again next month after Thanksgiving. Ray and Marsha, thanks so much. And folks, don't forget, if you missed any part of Meals from the Field or other features on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Farm Monitor. Plenty of stuff to choose from. In fact, archives go all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. Send us some feedback as well. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Well, there's a reason why UGA's turf program is world renowned and an innovator in the turf industry. See for yourself when the Farm Monitor continues. Welcome to the University of Georgia's Tifton campus, where we've been breeding turf and forage grasses since the 1930s for people around the United States and the world. Here at the UGA Tifton campus, the turf grass breeding program has a lot of history. In 1946, Dr. Glenn Burton, along with the USDA ARS, initiated the program in hopes to develop better Bermuda grasses to replace the current industry standards of sanded putting greens and seeded varieties. Since then, the program has released several greens type Bermuda grasses, including Tiff Green, Tiff Dwarf, and the latest release of Tiff Eagle in 1997. Here in our greenhouse in Tifton is where the process begins to develop new turf grasses. And I'm Brian Schwartz, and I'm the turf grass breeder here officially. But to be honest with you, we're all turf grass breeders. We concentrate on making hybrids of new Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, and centipede grasses that start in the greenhouse in little pots, but are expanded and grown in our fields for several years before we move them out to our research plots in other parts of the state and the country for evaluation. To my back, we have zoysia grass hybrids that we made this year. We're growing them out and we'll plant them in fumigated plots this year. We have other propagation of Bermuda grasses and zoysia grasses. We're sending to five other universities to get their input on the performance across the whole nation. The initial hybridization of new plants is my favorite part of the whole process. Every year we try to make between two to 6,000 hybrids to evaluate over the next five or 10 years. And in 2020, we were blessed with a great crossing season and in front of you here is our crosses and we've reached almost 10,000 this year. So we have golf course types, home lawn types and sports field types that we just can't wait to look at for the next several years. One of the major operations of our turf grass breeding program in the greenhouse is the maintenance of genetic purity, the propagation of new materials, and the measuring of morphology like leaf widths, leaf lengths, and inner node diameters. 
This is Jing Zhang. Uh, I'm a senior research associate. Uh, while working with uh, turf grass breeders to collect comprehensive data in the field trials using unmanned aerial systems. Field phenotyping has always been a bottleneck for plant breeders. Conventional method to collect data in the field trial at this uh, scale would take days. But using US, we were able to collect data in a few minutes, which uh, greatly enhanced breeders' capability to uh, screen large number of plant materials. The plant characteristics we're taking, to name a few, include greenness, person green cover, and the different vegetation indexes. All right, so this vehicle is our test platform for our tractor camera. We're developing a camera that's gonna go out on the tractor and be out in the field all day, where it'll um, record images of the field. And then when you come back, you're gonna upload that data, it'll create a map for you, indicating any problems such as weed pressure or disease. Right now, we're working on a model that'll identify weeds as the tractor images them. As we move forward, we're always looking for better grasses to help our local turf managers be the best that they can be. As we prepare for future Bermuda grass releases, we're performing different management strategies such as sprigging rates, fertilizer usage, and water management to help our turf managers better understand these grasses upon their release. We're also looking at different species as well. In 2016, we initiated our Zorgia grass greens trial where we were able to compare some of our hybrids to current industry standards. With a new species also comes different management strategies. But with our large plot sizes, we are able to test these different practices in order to find what works best. At the end of the day, we are working to make the turf industry a better place. It's personally satisfying to be here for this process because it represents about 20 years of research at the University of Georgia in collaboration with the USDA ARS, working with our friends here at Patent Seed to bag up a centipede grass product called Tiff Flare, which is grown here in Georgia and used not only in the southeast, but all over the world. If you had to name one accomplishment at the University of Georgia Turfgrass Breeding Program that I'm most proud of, it would be the release of Tiff Tough Bermuda Grass, which is a culmination of research efforts since the early 1990s, carried all the way out through the growers in Georgia and now over 50 growers in the United States, over 40 in the world, just in collaboration and coordination with the University of Georgia Research Foundation, Georgia Crop Improvement and Georgia Seed Development to get out a product that saves one of our most precious resources, which is water. I love working in this industry because everyone works together in order to achieve their goals. None of this would be possible without the help from the local sod farms and golf courses that allow the off-site trials, the money and equipment donations that are made each year, and the willingness of the professionals to share what they have learned during their time in the industry. For the last decade, we've been working on drought and shade tolerance here in Tifton, but we want to hear from you if we need to work on something else. Please feel free to contact me, Brian Schwartz, at tiffturf at uga.edu. Yes, great piece from our friends at UGA. Thanks so much, and thank you for once again making the Farm Monitor a part of your day. Before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news, Regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia Farms, be sure you check out our social media platforms, including our website at farm-monitor.com. You'll stay informed to see what's up in the world of ag and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. We're right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.